This will be a brief discussion about scientific thinking and includes what might be the most important concept of the semester, how do I know that? Or how do they know that? Or how do we know that? I'll explain in a minute. Following that is a generalized discussion of the development of plate tectonic theory. Shown here are MCC students and faculty employing the scientific method in looking at fossils in the Kaibab Formation along the upper part of the Hermit Trail in the Grand Canyon. A common misconception is that geology is not a real science, like physics or chemistry. Well, the fact of the matter is, any science is distinguished by its methodology and how it goes about getting answers to questions. And as with the other science disciplines, Geology employs the scientific method in its pursuit of trying to explain what we see in the world around us. For instance, look at these folds here in this roadside outcrop. Many questions would come to mind immediately, like, what am I looking at? How does that form? When did that form? Etc. These are all questions that we may try to answer, and some might be easily answered and others not. But the first thing a field geologist would do is sketch what they see. And that's easy enough. Just collect observational data here and sketch it. And just try to show what you see with no interpretation or anything else. Asking the questions, then collecting the data, and then trying to explain it. And we might come up with several different options for how these folds form. Interpretation of the origin of what we see may or may not be so easy, and a geologist has to come to grips with the fact that sometimes these answers may not be so readily forthcoming. The scientific method is the orderly, logical process we use to observe and interpret our environment. It involves a few basic steps. First, we make observations, like these students are doing here at Red Mountain just north of Flagstaff. Next is to try to explain these observations or even make predictions based on those observations. This is known as formulating a hypothesis. An important requirement is that the hypothesis be testable. And if it's not testable, then it's not science. So then we collect data, we experiment, and then we test the explanations. We test the hypotheses. A hypothesis supported by data becomes a scientific hypothesis. And we typically form several of these hypotheses to explain most problems. Furthermore, a group of valid hypotheses is what we consider a theory. Remember, a hypothesis is not a theory as a hypothesis is a possible explanation that has not yet been proven valid. How many times do you hear people using the word theory? They have a theory about something. Is it really a theory? Is their idea testable? Often what they are really saying is that they have a hypothesis or just an opinion. But a theory sounds much better and makes us feel smart. The funny thing is, we employ this process every day, and we don't even think about it. Each one of us does this, and we do it a thousand times a day, and so in some way, we are all scientists. Let's take a quick look at the Red Mountain area, where these students are pausing to make a sketch. Red Mountain is a neat place to visit. It's readily accessible off of Highway 180, just north of Flagstaff. There's a parking area here and then a trail with a nice walk over to the mountain itself. And to the west is Red Mountain, which is really a combination cinder cone and tuff cone, where the wall of the old volcano has been eroded. So when you look at the ground view here, 
takes you inside the amphitheater, which is formed in the wall of the old volcano. In amongst the ponderosa pine are these ravines and walls with numerous hoodoos and eroded rock. It's a really special place to visit. Red Mountain is one of many volcanoes in the San Francisco volcanic field. And if we back out and look at where Red Mountain's located, it's on the northwest side of the volcanic field. Here's Flagstaff, and so this is the San Francisco volcanic field. And so we're right on the northwest edge, right off Highway 180, between Flagstaff and the Grand Canyon. Here's a simple example of the scientific method. One of your tires is flat. That's an observation, one that we hope we never make. Okay, but we've all been there. How did that happen? That's a question that needs an answer. So we form multiple explanations or hypotheses. And some hypotheses to explain the flat tire may include a wild animal bit into it, or the old neglected tire just plain wore out. Or, I previously ran over something sharp. These are all possible explanations, what we call multiple working hypotheses. Now to test these hypotheses, we simply inspect the tire. If there are deep penetrating bite marks, then maybe our wild animal hypothesis is the correct one. Or if the steel belts are showing through the rubber, then maybe the neglected tire scenario is the winner. But if there is a puncture or even a piece of metal sticking out of the tire, like one of these, then the sharp object scenario is the correct hypothesis. So simply observe, offer some possible explanations, and then pick the most reasonable one. How about, is the earth flat? Next time you're at the beach, you may see a ship sailing over the horizon and some possible explanations or hypotheses may include the earth is flat. Captain of the ship just drove it right off the edge and we don't see it anymore. Or the earth is round and the ship traveled so far it basically passed out of sight below the horizon. Or, beyond the horizon, there be dragons. So, to test the hypothesis, we could sail a ship or watch one and see it go out of sight and wait for its return. And if it returns, they can tell us if there's an edge to the world or not. Our last example will be a complicated one to be sure, global warming, or as it has been rebranded, climate change. This has been a high profile topic for several decades, since the 1990s, at least since the hysteria of global cooling from the 1970s. This topic, as I mentioned, is highly complicated, even though it can be presented in fairly simplistic terms. It is also highly politicized. And it's almost always presented as a settled argument or settled science. But nothing could be farther from the truth. There are many problems with how this topic has been approached and handled. In sum, the argument is that mean global temperature has risen over time. By itself, this can be debated as what are we really talking about? What is a mean global temperature? How is it measured? How accurate is it? Does it change? Many, many questions about that in itself. In fact, there are several different data sets which are used to calculate this temperature. Uh, one is land data, from which we have the best coverage. However, it's limited to areas where there's population. And also, you're 
getting the temperature of the lowest levels of the atmosphere. Their sea data, which spread coverage out a lot farther around the world, more uniform, but it's more sparse. Balloon data is used to measure temperature of different levels in the atmosphere, as is satellite data, which basically sees through the whole column of atmosphere. So again, what are we really talking about? Rising temperatures, rising over what period of time? 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years? Risen by how much? 0.1 degree centigrade, 0.2 degree centigrade, 1 degree centigrade, 10 degree centigrade. So reasonable scientists can certainly sit down and discuss the differences in these data sets and what they represent. The fact that they don't all agree is a warning sign, but let's just go with it. Let's assume for the sake of the argument that there is a warming trend. The graphs here are satellite data for the northern hemisphere on the left and the southern hemisphere on the right. And it's over a period from which we started taking satellite measurements of the atmosphere from the late 1970s until about the year 2000, so a 25-year period. On the right, for the southern hemisphere, you can see there is no increase in temperature over this time. And for the northern hemisphere on the left, there is a small increase of 0.4 degrees centigrade over this 25-year period. But for the sake of argument, let's assume that there is an increase in temperatures over time. What is it due to? How can we explain this? What are the hypotheses that explain this warming trend? Well, there are several, if not more, but you only hear about one. And the one that you always hear about is called anthropogenic global warming or human-caused global warming. So humans are the reason. But there are other possibilities as well. It could be the sun, heliogenic global warming. And so it's all the sun's fault. Or it could be other natural causes that play a role of some kind that we're not really aware of. So we need to test these hypotheses. But how do we do that? How do we test something that we don't really know about in that third option? How do we separate quantify human contribution to warming from that of the sun. These are all problems. Not just is it warming, but what does it do to? There are two fundamentally different problems, and each one has complicated factors involved. Well, testing is what scientists do, and that means collecting more data, hopefully data that links the cause with the effect. But as I mentioned, just exactly how do you do that? How do we know the exact contribution of one factor versus another? The reality of the situation is, no matter what the media tells you or any politician, these ideas are still being tested, or at least they should be, and nothing has been definitively proven for sure. Now, I have no dog in this hunt in terms of whether it's swarming or not. I'm just looking at it. Basically, consensus science is not science. Just because somebody says it so doesn't mean it's so. And so there are many questions about this topic, many unanswered questions. There are many variables that are still to be figured out for us to be able to be sure about the answers for these questions. Let me show you some additional data. The graph in the middle there is data from the Vostok Drill Corps in Antarctica, which drills through several thousand feet of ice and basically gets a historical record going back 400,000 years of isotope data, basically of the Earth's atmospheric temperature and its carbon dioxide content. And so just from looking at that graph, you can see there have been highs and lows of both, and they more or less correspond with each other. So what we're really looking at is the, the last 400,000 years of the ice age in which we're still currently living. Each extended cold period followed by a warm period, an interglacial, and then that's followed by another long period of cold, short period of warm, and it goes on. Dozens of these glaciations and interglacials have occurred in the last 3 million years. 
And so this is the last 400,000 years of it. And it shows that temperature has risen and fallen over time without any contribution from humans. The earliest Homo sapiens is about 300,000 years. The earliest civilization, what is that? A few thousand years. The Industrial Revolution, what was that? 150 years ago, 200 years ago? So obviously these changes occurred through some kind of process that has nothing to do with humans. One other thing here is the blue curve and the red curve. The blue curve is the temperature and the red curve is carbon dioxide. And we've always been taught that, well, if you increase the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse effect basically traps solar radiation and heats up the atmosphere. Yes, that is true. But let's look at the data here. And in places where the interglacials are starting, there's a very rapid increase in temperature. In fact, the temperature precedes the increase in carbon dioxide. Wait a minute, that's opposite of what we're being told. Increase the carbon dioxide, then the temperature follows. Well, we're probably talking about a few decades, maybe a hundred years or so on this scale. But there's clear indication that temperatures rose first, followed by carbon dioxide. So how can you explain that? One idea is that as the Earth warms, CO2 that is contained in the Earth's oceans gets exhaled as they warm, increasing the CO2 content in the atmosphere. And as the Earth cools, CO2 becomes trapped in the oceans. It's a big carbon dioxide reservoir. So basically it's the Earth breathing over time during this glaciation. Interesting to think about, not just the fact that there could be a reason for this cycling. We're still trying to figure it out too because there's a number of different factors. But the fact that this all occurred before humans really ever had any kind of significant presence on the planet. The data at the bottom there shows sunspot data correlated with uh, global temperature and you can see there's a pretty good correlation. We've had sunspot data since Galileo and others started peering into the heavens and started logging sunspot data continuously. That's a pretty good correlation. We can note these correlations, we can note these patterns, explaining them can be much harder. And so we're still working it out. Let's look at the global temperatures over the last few thousand years of human history. You can see it was fairly warm and then cold and then very warm during the time of the pharaohs and then was cold and Roman Empire was a warm period. The Dark Ages, very cold. And then the medieval warm period. And then what's known as the Little Ice Age, a period of very intense cold. And the current warm period in which we live. So you can see these pre-industrial ups and downs, ups and downs of temperatures. At least 75 major temperature swings in the last 4,500 years alone not even counting the hundreds of thousands of years before. Why doesn't the media academic complex tell us about all of these non-human related variations? Temperature. That's a good question. I think you may know the answer to that, but we'll move on. Now let's talk about how we usually think. Well, we tend to like certainty in black and white situations, even where none may exist. We need to acknowledge that complex situations exist and that clear answers may not be available or even understandable. We tend to relate new information into our existing perceptions. This may not initially be a bad thing if our preconceptions are correct, but we need to be careful as it's always dangerous to build our scientific arguments on shaky foundations. And then we tend to jump to conclusions with very little or even no data. Unfortunately, this is all too common in today's world. The human ego is a major factor that should have no bearing on how science is done. So how can we become better thinkers? 
Well, for one, it's always good to look at concepts and problems from different points of view and think outside the box. Without being too cynical, we can question assumptions and not always take things for granted. And one of the most important points of the semester right here is to separate what you know from what you assume. In other words, ask yourself, how do I know that? Or how do they know that? How do we know that? Very important to ask these questions. Well, let's relate some of the 20th century's big ideas in the geological sciences to the overall scientific process we've been discussing. The first idea is that of continental drift. This idea was advanced by the German researcher Alfred Wegener in the early 20th century, and he compiled several different types of observations, including the jigsaw puzzle fit of the southern continents, with glacial striations on each continent pointing in different directions, but once the continents are put together, they seem to be all radiating out from certain point, which would have been the South Pole. Of course, there's the matching rock types on either side of the Atlantic Ocean in North America and in Europe. So those matching rock types and features uh, now widely separated continents could be a sign that there was continental movement. And then similar aged land fossils on different continents in South America and Africa. So, Wegener's explanation or hypothesis was that continents have moved or drifted over time and were once part of a massive supercontinent he called Pangaea. And we can see the Earth's surface today with the current distribution of continents and a paleo reconstruction of the Earth's surface some 260 million years ago back during the time of Pangaea. So, Wegener is saying that these continents were once part of a supercontinent, Pangaea, and they broke apart and traveled to their present locations over time. After setting up his hypothesis of continental drift, Wegener tried to set about the process of testing it. And the problem was that in the early part of the 20th century, we didn't have the data or the knowledge to understand the driving mechanism what's moving the plates around. And unfortunately, Wegener's ideas could not be tested by others, and the driving mechanism of continental drift remained unknown until even after his death. And this is the last known picture of Wegener upon the ice sheet in Greenland. Largely as a consequence of the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, the ocean floor began to be mapped out and understood. And so new technologies were gathering data and the data was being compiled and in the early 1960s there was enough information available for us to start to put things together and try to explain in some unified way how the sea floor was created. And this is the idea of sea floor spreading. And basically the various data described the layout, age, composition, geophysical makeup of many different features, including these things called mid-ocean ridges. Of these mid-ocean ridges, we found that the seafloor around them, in either direction, going away from the mid-ocean ridge, became older and colder and lower in elevation. This shows the geophysical nature of the mid-Atlantic ridge just southwest of Iceland. These magnetic stripes you wouldn't see with your eye, but a magnetometer would pick them up and it shows the symmetrical nature of the magnetic stripes on either side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Well, this is all data that was collected, and by the early 1960s, we started to put things together, and we called it C4 spreading. Several scientists contributed to the promotion of the idea of C4 spreading, and the basic hypothesis was that new oceanic crust is created at mid-ocean ridges and spreads outward in either direction. And so as it spreads outward, the crust gets older with newer crust being formed at the mid-ocean ridge, pushing older crust aside in either direction, 
And as it does so, the crust cools off. And then as it cools, it sinks more and becomes lower in elevation. So older, colder, and lower in each direction away from the mid-ocean ridge. This is an important process in terms of driving mechanisms of oceanic plates. And this is something that Wegener could not predict. This diagram here shows the evolution of an ocean basin, the mid-ocean ridge here creating the oceanic crust. As it spreads, new oceanic crust is formed at the mid-ocean ridge and older crust is pushed aside in either direction. And the new crust at the mid-ocean ridge is acquiring the magnetic signature of the magnetic field at the time. And so you'll see these polarity switches and these are the magnetic stripes that we see in the geophysical data. So over time, more oceanic crust formed at the mid-ocean ridge with a different magnetic polarity, normal, reverse, normal, reverse. And as the ocean basin widens, we see more and more of these stripes and the oceanic crust getting older and older and older in each direction away from the mid-ocean ridge and getting colder and lower as well. So this is the explanation offered for C4 spreading. New oceanic crust is created at mid-ocean ridges. Well, to test this idea, we've collected more data on the age of the mid-ocean ridges and the surrounding ocean floor, the composition of the rocks, the different geophysical signatures, both gravity and magnetism was measured from all over the world's ocean basins whether it was from ships or submarines or little unmanned submersibles like this we collected this data this shows in color here the ages of the c4 in the pacific atlantic and indian oceans with red being the youngest and you can see this is the mid-ocean ridge in the pacific called the east pacific rise here's the mid-atlantic ridge and then the mid-indian ridge over here so in either direction away from the East Pacific rise, for example, the crust gets older and older and older. Same thing in the Atlantic. So a symmetrical age pattern as well as a symmetrical magnetic pattern. So the accumulation of data very quickly allowed the validation of C4 spreading as a theory. So First, there was Wegener's continental drift idea of the early 20th century. And then there was C4 spreading in the early 1960s. And very soon thereafter came plate tectonics. Still in the 1960s, this was the big idea in the geological sciences in the 20th century. And so the observations continued to be made during the 1960s. And Various types of seismic and volcanic and geophysical data all compiled together from both continental areas and oceanic areas. A kind of critical mass was building here, and plate tectonics was the result. This map right here shows the distribution of seismic data around the world, and you can see it is not homogeneous. There is definite concentration of earthquakes in bands, 90% or more of earthquakes take place in these regions here, which we'll see correspond to the edges of tectonic plates. And then there's volcanic data, which is similar. We can see volcanoes occurring in certain patterns and in certain locations. Still in the 1960s, the main ideas of continental drift and C4 spreading merged into the singular hypothesis of plate tectonics, which, simply put, suggests that the Earth's outer layer is divided into many strong lithospheric plates that move around and interact with each other. So Wegener was talking in terms of continents and oceans. Uh, this is a little different. For instance, here is the North American lithospheric plate, which includes both continental crust and oceanic crust the South American plate, both continental crust and oceanic crust. The same thing said for the African plate, the Eurasian plate, the Indian plate, Australian plate, Antarctic plate, Pacific plate, Nazca, Cocos, these are all pretty much oceanic only. These are what are called tectonic plates, and they were 
defined by the earthquake data, the volcanic data, and other geophysical data. This grand idea was tested by imaging the Earth's tectonic plates with seismic reflection, refraction, and tomography. Here's an example from the area near New Zealand of earthquake data, and it shows earthquake foci, the origin location of an earthquake, and some earthquakes occur in shallow levels, and with depth you can see that there's green and blue and purple and red. Depth of earthquake foci tell us kind of where the plate is. We can see from this that there's a progression from east to west of earthquake depths from shallow in the eastern parts and they get progressively deeper to the west. This idea is thought to represent the fact that tectonic plate is subducting or diving down beneath another one. And as it goes, it gets deeper and deeper, and the earthquakes get deeper and deeper. And thus we see a boundary here between two different plates, and that's what the yellow line is. Here's another look at this subducting plate going down to the left, one beneath the other one. The most shallow focus earthquakes and then the yellow focus earthquakes would be a little bit deeper, and then the green ones, and the blue ones, and the purple, and then red. So it's the earthquake foci data that allows us to know what the 3D geometry is of these tectonic plates. And we use this data to map out the distribution and location of the plate boundaries. So decades later, rates of plate movement have been directly measured using lasers and global positioning systems, GPS. These tests have supported the main idea of plate tectonics as the unifying process that explains many of Earth's geological phenomena. Although there have been some slight modifications over time, the main framework of plate tectonic theory has held up quite well since its debut in the 1960s. Our job is not done, however, and we continue to collect new data and observe new natural phenomena that generate new questions about our home planet. Well, that's all for now. Till next time. <laughs>